Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the Cedarfield family. I hope you are all doing well this afternoon. Thank you for tuning in to our live stream. Uh, the format for today is as follows. I have a, a couple of opening remarks related to the executive order from yesterday. Dr. Shear and Ann Hopper will be here about other tidbits from our wellness clinic. And then I will round out uh, this live stream with some more administrative uh, updates about services around the community. So first, just wanna talk about the Virginia governor's uh, statement from yesterday, the stay at home executive order. The Cedarfield residents and team members I know are continually adhering to self-quarantining and physical distancing in order to flatten the curve. I hope you are not taking those two terms lightly. We are asking every single resident private duty person and team member to maintain physical distance, avoid social gatherings. I'm gonna talk about traveling outside the community in a bit. And everyone take advantage of the technology that we have available to ourselves today. Or, even taking advantage of something that was created a long time ago called the telephone. So a bit about travel. For the residents that live at Cedarfield, if you travel outside this community, I need to know. I need to know if you're traveling outside of this community. Outside of this community is not staying at home. And there's a lot of variability with you leaving outside of this community. There are other retirement communities in the city of Richmond that are mandating the residents don't leave their community for specific reasons. Period, no exceptions. We are not currently one of those communities. But should our situ situation escalate, we will become one of those communities very quickly. In order to avoid that particular situation, we are trying to flatten the curve which means social distancing and self-quarantining. We are here to protect you. I'm trying to protect my own family. The Cedarfield team members are trying to protect themselves while they're here. They also are trying to protect themselves while they are away from the community, which I'll get into in a second. So in consultation with the Pinnacle Living Office, and the Department of Health this morning, we are gonna track whereabouts. I'm gonna track whereabouts about staff, and I'm gonna track whereabouts of residents. We are creating a sign-out log at the gatehouse to understand your travel within Henrico County. So the governor, signed a stay-at-home executive order, and in order to further protect people who live and work here, I need to know specific information now. And no, I'm not babysitting. Trust me, this is not something I want to do. I have enough on my plate already. Should you choose to travel beyond the county, we are going to require residents to self-isolate for 14 days to ensure that you are not a carrier. 
Your travel within the Riker County should be limited to supermarkets, medically necessary appointments, exercise if you wish. Please don't take advantage of this policy to go visit friends and family. I am not visiting my family. My dad just got out of hip surgery and I really want to go see my dad. And I am not traveling to Pennsylvania to be with my family. I am cooped up in my own home with my, with my bride and my two sons and we are practicing self social distancing and self quarantining in my own home. And so are all the, we're trying strongly encouraging this practice with all of our team members here at Cedarfield. Should you wish to dine with family and friends, especially in groups of more than five outside of this campus, it is highly likely that you are potentially putting Cedarfield residents at risk. And I know we all don't want to do that. Some, not all, residents and team members are looking for loopholes or simply just not practicing social distancing and self-quarantining. And I cannot urge enough as your leader of this community. I am imploring everyone. Now, more than ever, we've been slowly ramping up for the last three weeks. These next two weeks are incredibly important. Two weeks are incredibly important, if not the whole month of April, that we just stay away from people. Particularly, people 65, age, 65 years of age and better. I know this is difficult, but we have no plans right now to relax practices and precautionary measures. Hopefully, over these live stream chats over the last two weeks, you've noticed that we keep ramping up restrictions. It's not because of punishments. Please stop emailing me that we are punishing people. I, it, I can assure you that I am not punishing people. I am trying to protect people. I am trying to keep people alive and safe and well. In consultation, with a lot of smart people around me. Those that work on the team here, the leadership team, our medical director, Dr. Moranian, Dr. Amy Shear, Ann Hopper, along with local officials with the Department of Health, our, our Virginia Healthcare Coalition, and our emergency management folks. I have some very smart, dedicated people that have a lot of experience around me. This stuff is not a punishment. This is real life stuff to protect everybody. So a word about the team members or the front line. They are the front line. You hear the word front line team, front line staff all over the media. The Cedarfield team is the front line. Make no mistake about it. The most frequently asked question, one of the most frequently asked questions I get from residents is the following. You are restricting us so much, Michael, the residents. What about your team members? Why don't they just stay home as well? That's sort of the theme of one of the most frequently asked questions. 
Every team member at Cedarfield is absolutely essential to keeping this community going right now. Keep it operating under the guidelines of a brand new CCRC that we've created here in the last few weeks. Every team member is essential. Team members also have a lot of different situations as well, and we are well equipped to handle the variety of situations that are coming at us uh, because of their personal life or because of something personal that's happening to that team member. And so we have a preparedness plan and a policy in place that is ever evolving right now in consultation with uh, the entities and the agencies that I just referenced. I and the leadership team, Renee and David and Sharon Brown, James Green, Christy, Stephanie, Matt, Melissa, Beth, all of the clinical leaders, the neighborhood leaders, we are focused on ways to protect the Cedarfield team and find ways to help them with a balance because they are on the front line. We are trying to monitor every team member right now, making sure that we're addressing any barrier that they are confronted with so that we can help keep them in control. We have changed our screening instruments at the gatehouse effective today. There are new questions on that screening instrument that the security officers as of three o'clock this afternoon will be using to further monitor people who are coming onto the property. The management team, we are constantly practicing our own social distancing by meeting via conference call. I have not gathered in a group meeting with my executive leadership team in over three weeks. We practice our meetings via uh, conference call or Zoom or video conferencing. And we are constantly educating our team members about how to protect themselves and their family outside of work. Today I'll be publishing another memo to the team members about how to further protect themselves and asking for their unwavering commitment while they're outside of Cedarfield to make sure that they are vigilantly adhering to the governor's executive order of staying at home and also practicing a lot of daily sanitary hygiene items inside of their own household so that they're protecting themselves and their family and all the while while they're coming to Cedarfield they are also protecting each other and or the residents of Cedarfield. So I know this is a very strong message to sign. I just think we really need to take, take it to another level, go a little bit deeper in our, our own behavior, our own way of adhering to these social distancing and self-quarantining practices in order to flatten and help the city of Richmond and Henrico County flatten the curve and also all the while we are in flattening our own curve here at Cedarfield. So you may see team members, like I mentioned yesterday, you may see team members walking around with masks, like this one. Hold on one second.
That is an N99 mask that I just procured the other day. And I want the residents of Cedarfield to know that the team is practicing. We are in practice mode now. So you may see team members wearing these masks around the community, whether you're in assisted living, whether you are in independent living in cottages or the apartments, or some residents may see it in the health center. We are in practice mode this week. And let me tell you, wearing this mask for more than 15 minutes is not pleasant. And so that's why we're practicing it as well. So team members can get used to wearing this mask and be comfortable with their own breathing inside of this mask as they're responding to a tabletop exercise. So the management team and I really believe that these tabletop exercises will really help uh, foster more courage, more knowledge, more expertise, and more confidence in the team when we have our first case here. So like I said, you may see team members wearing masks like that one. Uh, the other day, two days, yesterday, I was wearing a mask uh, early in the morning, responding to a situation with uh, Ann, Ann Hopper. We have new protocols in place. The uh, fire and rescue is demanding new protocols of us. It seems like every day there's a new protocol. And so we're constantly changing the health delivery system of Cedarfield. What we did naturally 30 days ago does not apply now. There's a whole set of different policies and practices. So the team, we need to practice these new protocols in order to be more comfortable with them. So those are my opening remarks. Next, we have uh, Dr. Shear and Ann Hopper. So welcome to them.
symptoms, but we're tracking to make sure you're stable with those. Um, so the biggest thing there is we want, we will not send you to the hospital. We want you to isolate in place um, if you're having difficulty or if you're starting to have a fever or a cough or that shortness of breath, um, mainly so that we can track it, make sure you're doing well, make sure, you know, it may be a regular cold and we definitely don't want to be sending you into an ER where you can potentially get infected it's much better for us to manage you here unless you need to be in the hospital. And if you need to be in the hospital, we need to be able to send you there. And we will be able to still help with that. Yes, all of those things, again, you're going to do what you normally do. We've always said, don't call the clinic if what you need is 911. Call 911, then call the clinic. Um, the clinic wants to know, but again, you know, if you're having a heart attack or if you're having a stroke, minutes count. So we do want you to be able to call 911 in those situations. Right. And then to add to that, um, we are still happy with this respiratory to call 911. But if, they, if a resident did call 911, you'll just answer so many more questions about symptoms that you have because the responders want to come in and the appropriate personal protective equipment that they need to wear. Yeah, so that's another reason why we can help you through this as long as you're stable enough to give us the time to do that. Um, if it's mild symptoms, if it's again one of those three symptoms of cough, shortness of breath, or fever, again, cough and shortness of breath, meaning not the cough that I have every, every week or you know once a month or that kind of thing, but a, but a new or worse cough um, outside what is your baseline. Shortness of breath that's worse than your baseline or outside of your baseline. Those are the things that we want you to be calling the clinic about. Um, fevers, and specifically anything above 100.2. Um, a true fever is not until 101.4, but we still want to know those low grade temperatures of 102 and above, 100.2 and above, sorry, um, 100.2 and above, in order to, you know, be calling the next day or having you recheck your temperatures, all those kind of things. Right. And to talk about fevers, we do have a limited supply of these disposable thermometers, and we have uh, a few hundred more ordered. They haven't been shipped yet. So at this point, if someone had a fever and did, or thought they had a fever and did not have a thermometer, they could call the clinic and we could get this disposable thermometer. It's a one-time use, so to hand them out right now it wouldn't be worth it because we don't want to use it just to check our baseline temperature. Exactly, exactly. We want to be all the supplies, you know, even if we have access and, and extra, we want to make sure that we're um, utilizing all of our resources, you know, being good stewards and, and using our resources appropriately. All right, and it looks like our questions are starting to come in. So we see some team members wearing masks. Should residents be wearing masks now? Um, I would say my answer to that is no. Um, and the reason why I would say no is because, especially if you are self-isolating, which is what we're requesting that you do, then your exposure right now is very minimal. Um, and if you're six feet apart from other residents and other providers, my thinking is, is that that's a mask that can potentially be used in a situation where we really need it. Um, we really want to make sure that when we are putting on masks, um, that we're not using more than one mask. Um, so sometimes you'll see some, some healthcare providers that will have had a mask on, and rather than throw that mask away, they do use it for the rest of the day. So sometimes you will see some of our staff members that have masks on, and that's you know mainly because they are needing it for one reason or another. But the WHO is recommending that we do not be using masks unless.
unless you're in a situation where you're being requested to put it on. So unless you're going into the emergency room and they're putting one on you, do not use up your mask. And if you have extra masks, I would ask that you bring those um, to the office so that we can discuss, you know, the hospitals, there are plenty of facilities that don't have what they need. You are fortunate here at Cedarfield in that I do believe that you have an appropriate number, but there are places out here that don't. Great. So going along with this mask, we have all seen uh, or have watched President Trump, and he was mentioning he actually had the Abbott, the new testing, and you need the machine that goes along with this little swab. What's the status of Cedarfield, do you think, getting one of these? Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we all just had one of those? Um, the reality is, until we physically have access to it, it, it's not here. And we don't know if and when we will get it back. So, you know, states are bidding on that right now. And they're having to decide and, you know, determine what, you know, who gets it first, where it goes, how many are there. You know, and I don't pretend to know all the details of that, but my thinking is we don't have it now. And the win of it is not all that important. When we have it, We'll have it, and for now we don't. And really, would anything change our protocol if no. we had this testing device or not? No, because we still would recommend with mild symptoms that you don't be tested. If you're able to self-quarantine for 14 days with mild symptoms, we're going to tell you to self-isolate for 14 days with mild symptoms. The reality is that even the supplies used to do any of these become very, become short supply, you know, when a test is available. So even then, they're going to have to practice stewardship of even the tests that are the 15-minute test. Okay. Now we're moving on to anxiety. We have a question. I can't sleep. What do I do? So I've been getting this question a lot. Um, and I feel you, I think we all do, mm -hmm. that, um, that it's hard to sleep at night right now. Um, and especially with everything in the news and with our kids worried and with us worried about our kids, um, it's just, this is not a fun time to be around right now. Um, and unfortunately that really affects our sleep. But we, what we really want to make sure right now is that we aren't medicating to go to sleep. Um, this has a lot of harmful implications for our daytime, um, as well as you know the type of sleep that you get with medication is not a restful sleep. So it's not a stage four sleep, and I'm sure we can go into that in more detail. But there's lots of things you can be doing um, to help with your sleep hygiene. I believe that we even have some uh, information about that specifically on, I want to say, our own. My Cedar Field, my Cedar Field the Wellness. The, the Wellness app. And I want to say that my, uh, Michael Shaw did a talk about it a while ago. Or? I think, I think so. Karen, just, Karen just loaded some information on it. Wonderful. So there are medications you can take, um, but again, if you don't need a medicine, it's better that you don't take anything. The other thing that we all tend to do is have a little extra glass of wine, or we might, you know, crack open an extra beer right now um, to soothe our nerves, because this is a very, you know, anxious time, you know, especially in the evening as we get ready. Again, that is not going to be helpful for you and has a lot of potential harm for waking up at night, being disoriented, falling, and the last thing you want to do is end up with a hip fracture and have to go to the hospital. Now is not the time for that, okay? So we really want to be practicing taking less naps during the day, staying more active during the day, all the things that are good for your health overall, you want to be doing right now in order 
room too, and that also helps with your sleep at night. Right. Okay. Here's another one that might go along with it. I feel anxious. What can I do? So um, I was thinking, and that's a good question. And I was actually feeling very anxious myself on um, Saturday, and kind of decided that I'm going to make it a practice for myself. Um, to have Sundays be my, my holiday from COVID. So on Sundays, I do not watch the news at all. Um, I, I feel like, you know, this disease and the numbers are going to increase whether or not I watch the news or not. Um, I do think that it's important to be informed, and I'm not trying to say that we need to bury our head in the sand to pretend that this isn't going on. But I think for me, I feel like I've limited myself to my local news. So I watch, you know, in the morning and in the evening. I do not try and watch, you know, news past that because I feel like there's a lot of negativity and there's a lot of information, again, maybe even good information, but I feel like the anxiety that comes along with receiving that information difficult stories that are out there really don't help me in my day to day. Now, I guess a little different for me is I'm also getting information from the CDC and I do try and update myself on the Virginia Department of Health and I watch the governor's um, presentation, but I do try and limit news and Facebook and, you know, the information overload that's out there and especially if I feel more anxious by doing that, um, I will try and I'll, I'll try and take the following day and say, okay, what were the things that made me feel worse? Is there a way that I can cut down on those? Okay. Um, here we go. We have more detail about the sleep tip tips. Sleep tips and how to handle anxiety are on Touchdown under emotional balance. Pathways. That icon. Pathways icon. So that's helpful. Um, so I think the other thing about social media is being really careful not to get those headlines, right? Those headlines that grab you about maybe New York and Central Park, what's going on there. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, that was for me very disturbing this morning um, watching the national news, and I thought to myself, how is me knowing what's going on in other states helping those states? If it, if it does help, then I want to be watching and I want to be addressing that. But if, but if it's not helping and it's only hurting, then I don't necessarily know that I need to be exposing myself to that because it can stagnate what I'm doing. Um, so I do think it's important for me especially that I know what's going on in the long-term care communities that I'm, you know, updating myself with important information and protocols and I, I do all of that, but when it comes to my friends on Facebook and the difficulties they're going through in Florida and in New York and in Chicago, it's, it, it, it's too overwhelming sometimes and I think that we do need a break from it a little bit. That we need to practice good, you know, good self-care, um, and and part of that too is I also want to say one of the things that I try and do is um, try and be more outwardly focused because I think that when we think about ourselves and our problems, um, that can also kind of again make us feel more and more self-isolated. Um, so one of the things my friends and I do is we do a Zoom meeting. But there's also, you know, phone trees. You know, I think for the residents here, if you normally ate with another couple, are you checking up on that couple? Are you calling them? Are you asking how they're doing? And I think we all need to be asking each other how we're feeling, not just are you coughing, you know? Right, right. You know, it's not just our physical health that's important right now. We do need to be asking about each other's um, mental health. That's great. Here's another one. How about nutrition and hydration? So now that our um, eating, you know, the dining rooms, the atrium, they're closed. So what do you have to say about meals and hydration? So um, it's, again, now is the time to really be focused on healthy lifestyle, healthy 
healthy eating, um, when we become anxious and when we become, you know, and it's also, I hate to say, a little bored because we're not able to do the things that we normally do activity-wise, um, we tend to go for those carb-rich foods and we tend to go for the comfort foods and because we want that comfort. The unfortunate thing with that is then we end up with the health implications and right now we want to keep you as healthy as possible. Um, so really trying to avoid those high carbs, high salt, um, the intake there, um, eating some fresh vegetables, eating, you know, what I'm seeing when I go to the grocery store and hopefully you're not going to the grocery store, but um, the produce is a plenty, you know, every, if you walk down the, you know, macaroni and cheese aisle, there's nothing. But if you go to the produce section, there's lots of vegetables, there's lots of lettuce, there's lots of salads, there's lots of you know items that you can eat that's more on the healthier side. Um, again, so I don't think we have a shortage of that yet, and I think it's really important that we maintain you know a, a healthy eating, you know healthy eating habits right now. Um, so you know I would really you know it's a good time. Most of the time we feel like we don't have time. one thing that they were referring to. It is my belief that no one is really independent. We are really codependent human beings from the time that we are born. From the time that we're born, we're codependent on parents. And as we tra travel through life, I believe that we are dependent on many sources in order to live independently. With that in mind, Florence Brooks and Matt Dameron asked a very important question yesterday with the management team. They said, many folks in assisted living and in independent living have some support along the way in order to stay independent. And now that we have so many restrictions at the community, those little support systems 
doesn't necessarily mean that the resident is either happy about that or can actually still function in that day to day. Maybe they need some layer, what other layer of support can we provide? So the team met today, we are, we are naming uh, something called Operation Wellbeing. More to come about it in the next couple of days ahead. But the team is looking at a way to look at a safety net to make sure that we're vitally capturing the needs of a resident given all the restrictions that we have on the property so that we can assure ourselves and assure the residents that we are trying our best to help with those nine domains of well-being. So more to come over the next several days about operation well-being. I did want to mention one other thing that I neg uh, neglected to say in my opening comments regarding our new protocol at the gatehouse. Should a resident choose to, this is any resident, in, in healthcare, assisted living, um, or independent living, should a resident choose to leave Henrico County um, for an extended period of time and then come back, we are going to ask that resident to self-isolate, not even self-quarantine, self-isolate for 14 days, given the exposure that you may have had, even with other people or just touching other services uh, beyond that period of time. Um, I want to re-emphasize one thing that Dr. Shear just said, the World Health Organization is not recommending that every human being on planet Earth wear a mask. In fact, it's actually unsafe to do that because there is research to show that the next logical place that somebody starts to touch their face when they're wearing a mask is their eyes, um, not to mention the fact that every person that is well doesn't need to wear a mask. Um, thank you to all the residents who have, were very compliant over the last two days with getting your mail. I cannot thank you enough. I was talking with our U.S. Postal Carrier uh, this morning in the bathroom adjacent to the, the mailboxes, and he was almost in tears. And here's the reason why. He says, it's such a joy to come to Cedarfield because of all of the... One more thing about transportation. Um, Anne Reed and her team of shoppers were able to help 27 different residents today. So thank you, Anne. On average, they are uh, delivering packages Monday through Thursday now to almost 30 different residents. Tomorrow is Wednesday, I believe track of days here. Tomorrow is Wednesday, and so those of you that live in the cottages can take advantage of the drop-off uh, supply shuttle program. So if you have loved ones that are outside the community and want to take advantage of that program, uh, the cottages
cottage folks, you're up tomorrow. Uh, David Stewart just wanted to say thank you to the residents. Your feedback in making the program is greatly appreciated. All the emails and texts that have come in, uh, he really appreciates the, uh, the feedback to strengthen the process. So uh, these last couple of days, we've taken even further tidbits to make that uh, delivery program even uh, better. So thank you to the residents for your feedback. And then lastly on my plate, just want to continue to encourage people, those of you that have computers, those of you that are talking to loved ones near and far, um, feel free to guide them to www.mycedarfield.com. Once they're there, they will be guided to this page. At the very bottom, there's a guest access um, link that will guide somebody outside of this campus to this page, and anybody can utilize, I'm utilizing these three main icons um, here at, in the beginning of Touchdown. The coronavirus updates, the team member announcement updates, and the pathways to wellness icon. So please encourage people to uh, utilize those icons. Every single one of us has a personal responsibility in this situation. Every one of us has a role to play in the solution. If we don't, we are putting other people at risk. We have no known cases of COVID-19 at Cedarfield at this time. Should you have any questions about this live chat, please feel free to contact the administration suite, uh, contact any one of the department directors. They should have some answers to any of your questions. Please be super vigilant on this fine Tuesday with self-quarantining and social distancing. We absolutely have a mandate to flatten this curve here at Cedarfield and in Riker. With that, I'm going to turn over the microphone to Florence Brooks, who has some spiritual help for us. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the questions um, offered to Dr. Shear and Ann during the live stream, particularly around the anxiety. And I was thinking a lot about that earlier today and how all of us, to some degree, have experienced anxiety. Perhaps when you prepare to move to Cedarfield, you had some anxiety. Or maybe when you've been waiting on a doctor's um, results from a test, you had some anxiety. Or maybe you've been concerned about family members when, you were, when your children were younger. Or even now, you've experienced some anxiety. And now with the coronavirus, a lot of people are talking about anxiety and the restlessness and along with that, a lot of the tools perhaps that we were accustomed to using, maybe a, a person in our life who has been there checking on us on a daily basis, or person people that we've been able to see, or doctors that we've been able to see, we're not able to see now. And so we, it's important for us to spend some time thinking about tools that we can utilize right now. Some of you are people of prayer, some of you use scripture, some of you read poetry. I see lots of Cedarfield residents going for walks outside. Those are all tools to help us, to help us in anxious times. An exercise I'd like to share with you this afternoon is called the five senses. And the five senses is an exercise that you can use at any time, in any place. And the whole purpose is to move you out of the what if thinking into the right now thinking. So if you would, just take a deep breath. And do that again. Take a deep breath. And then just easily move into breathing. And just appreciate that breath and how that being in touch with our breath can be very calming to us. 
and the five senses will come to a countdown from five to one. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves, what are five things we can see right now? Just look around where you are and think of those five things that you can see. It might be a lamp, a chair, the television. What are five things you can see? Keep breathing. And after you name those five things, what are four things you can touch around you? It might be your hair, the sleeve of your arm, a ring, the ground under your feet. What are four things you can touch around you? And now what are three things? Three things you can hear. It might be the air conditioning or the home of a refrigerator. Peace.